الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الحمد لله it's nice to be back in Glasgow nice to see the brothers again the unfortunate thing is that I give my talks and I have to go straight back they tell me that Scotland's a very beautiful place inshallah one of these days I'm gonna to take out a few days and see the scenery inshallah can I ask the brothers to come slightly closer unless you have a chronic back problem your post six feet please come slightly closer <coughs> Quite a few guys with chronic back pains in Glasgow. Not enough doctors. <clears throat> if you look into the family tree of certain individuals, you will see that they have great illuminaries. People who have a deep impact on society. And these illuminaries have an impact on this particular individual, but also they have an impact on society, and they leave their imprints on the pages of history. If you look into the life and the family tree of Yusuf alayhi salatu salam, you will see that he was a Nabi. His father Yaqub alayhi salatu salam was a Nabi. His, gra- his grandfather Ishaq alayhi salatu salam was a Nabi. His grandfather's brother, Ismail alayhi salatu salam was a Nabi and his great grandfather Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam was a Nabi. Kareem ibn al Kareem, Zuriyatun ba'dhuha ba'dha. And today I want to speak about a man who didn't have Prophet after Prophet in his lineage, but he had those people who were the greatest of creation after the Anbiya alayhi salatu salam. For his grandfather was no other than Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu regarding who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَوُزِنَ إِمَانُ أَبِي بَكْرِ بِإِمَانِ أَهْلِ الْأَلْءِ لَرَجَهَ بِي If the Iman of Abu Bakr was placed in one side of the scale, and the Iman of the entirety of humanity was placed in the other side of the scale, the Iman of Abu Bakr would outweigh the Iman of the entirety of humanity. His, uh, his grandmother was Safiya radiallahu anha, the auntie of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the first woman in the history of Islam to shed the blood of the enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his auntie was that woman upon occasion the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked O oh, beloved of Allah, who is the most beloved person to you? And he said it was Aisha radiallahu anha. And to Aisha radiallahu anha, the most beloved person after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, was this particular Sahabi. And in his lineage, he had a woman regarding who Jibra'il alayhi salatu wasalam descended upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Khadija is about to enter the room. Inform her, Allah yukri alayhi salam, that Allah sends her his salams. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends her his salams. His mother was Asma bin Abi Bakr radiallahu anha. Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anha. She was the 17th person to embrace Islam. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa migrated from Makkah to Medina and he remained in this cave, what she would do is that she would cook the food and endangering her own life, she would take the food to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And upon occasion, they had nothing to tie the food with. And what she did is that she took her waist belt and she tore it into two. And with one she tied the waist and the other she gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to tie the food with. And after that day, she was known as Dhat and Ataqain. Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu mentioned that I know nobody who was more generous than my mother and my auntie, but their generosity was different. As for my auntie, what she would do is that she would accumulate all her wealth and then she would spend everything in the path of Allah. And what my mother would do is that she would accumulate wealth and every night, every night, whatever surplus she had, she would give in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His father was Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu anhu, one of the ten who was guaranteed Jannah by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لِكُلِّ نَبِينَ هَوَارِيُّ وَإِنَّ هَوَارِيَ Zubair. That every Prophet has a disciple. And my disciple is Zubair. In another narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that Zubair and Talha's house will be next to my house in Jannah. He was 
when he embraced Islam at the age of 15, and when his uncles found out that he had embraced Islam, what they did is that they tied him upside down and they lit a fire underneath him until he thought that he was going to die out of suffocation. And then they brought him down and then they said, are you ready to renounce your religion? And he said, never. He said, never. Because this experience had made him stronger. Because he understood that if this was the impact of just the smoke of this dunya, then what will be the impact of the fire of Jahannam? And he said, never will I denounce his religion. And then they tied him up again, and they hung him up upside down, and they lit a fire underneath him, and they did this again and again, until their resolve broke, but his resolve didn't break. From his virtues is that he was awwal or rajrin, sallah sayfu lillah, the first man in the history of Islam to draw his blood, to draw his sword. Upon occasion, the rumor spread in Mecca that the Mushrikeen had killed the Prophet ﷺ and Zubair radiallahu anhu was just a child at that time. He drew his sword and he went into the streets of Mecca. And one of the first people he bumped into was the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Zubair, where are you going? And he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I heard that the Mushrikeen had killed you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, What would you have done if this was true? And he said, I swear by Allah, I had taken an oath by Allah that I would make the streets of Makkah flow with the blood of the Mushrikeen. And the Prophet ﷺ smiled and he prayed for him and he prayed for his sword. And the impact that the dua of the Prophet ﷺ was such that the Sahaba mentioned that there were only two men who could hold swords in both hands and fight equally well with both hands. One was Sayfullah Khalid bin Walid and the other was Abdullah ibn Zubair uh, the other one was Zubair ibn al-Awam The first was Khalid bin Walid that they could hold swords in both hands and they could control their horses with their feet. And then came the battle of Badr and how Zubair ibn al-Awam showed his skills. The entire Entire cavalry on the Muslims on the battle of Badr were two men, Miqdad and Zubair ibn al-Awwam. Only two men. And the narrations mention that Zubair ibn al-Awwam, he was striking the Mishriqi left and right, left and right. And so beloved to Allah was the sacrifice of Zubair ibn al-Awwam on the battle of Badr. That this was the first battle in which the angels descended to help the Muslims. And the narrations mention that on that day, Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu, he had a yellow turban on. And when the angels descended on the battle of Badr, they were all wearing yellow turbans. Every single one of them were wearing yellow turban because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved the sacrifice of Zubair ibn al-Awwam. And then came the battle of Uhud and he subhanallah, he shone again. Again, the entire, entire cavalry of the Muslims were two men, Miqdad and Zubair radiallahu anhu. And one of the greatest warriors from the Arabs stood up from the side of the Mushrikeen and he said, who is ready to fight me? And Zubair radiallahu anhu said, oh Messenger of Allah, allow me to fight him. And he went out and Safiya radiallahu anha, his mother said, oh Messenger of Allah, where are you sending him? For this is imminent death, nobody comes back live fighting this man. And the Prophet sallallahu said, no, inshallah, he will be victorious. And the narrations mention that Zubair radiallahu anhu went out and the mushrik was standing, sitting on his horse. And Zubair radiallahu anhu was standing on the floor. And he managed to jump upon the horse. And he defeated this mushrik. And then he brought this horse back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam upon that occasion said, لِكُلِّ نَبِينَ هُوَارِيُّنْ وَإِنَّ هُوَارِيَ Zubair." That every prophet has a disciple. And my disciple is Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu anhu. And battle after battle, he spent with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He fought with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam until a person of Basra explains and depicts the sacrifices of Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu anhu. He mentions that upon occasion I was traveling with Zubair ibn al-Awam and he had a wet dream and he wanted to have a bath. And he said, can you cover me? Can you cover my body so I can have a bath? And he said, I put a cloth around him and my eyes accidentally fell upon his body. And he said, I swear by Allah, I have never seen a body like his body. For it was as though a person had writ upon, written upon his body with wounds. His entire body was full of wounds. And I asked him after he finished his bath, he said, my eyes accidentally fell upon your body. He said, I said, where did you attain all these wounds from? And he said, I swear by Allah, each and every one of these wounds was attained fighting alongside the Prophet ﷺ in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each one of these. And his son Urwat ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu mentioned that such were the wounds on my father's shoulder that I could thrust portions of my fingers into his, into his back.
These were his sacrifices that he gave for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibn Jirmuz, he killed Zubair radiallahu anhu whilst he was praying salah. And he sent the sword to Ali ibn Talib radiallahu anhu. And the narrations mentioned that when Ali saw, saw the sword of Zubair radiallahu anhu, he began to cry so profusely that the people outside the tent could hear him crying. And then he said, Give glad tidings to Ibn Jarmuz of Jahannam, of the fire of Jahannam. For I heard the Prophet Sallallahu saying that the merger of the son of Sophia would dwell in the fire of Jahannam. And then he took the sword. And he said, How many a time this sword protected the Prophet Sallallahu How many a time the sword protected the Prophet Sallallahu And this is why Umar radiallahu anhu would say that Zubair is one of the pillars of Islam due to his fact sacrifices for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rewarded him for his sacrifices. For on the final khutbah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave, his final khutbah, he said, I am leaving this dunya and with Zubair I am happy. I am leaving this dunya and with Zubair ibn al-Awam I am happy. One of the ten who was guaranteed Jannah. And Asma radiallahu anha mentions that when I married Zubair, the only thing he had was a horse. That was the only possession that he had. You look at these people. They are people for whom Allah gives a guarantee. These were the people who were the best after the Anbiya alayhi salatu salam. And the only thing that he had was a horse. Because these people, their pockets may have been empty, but their hearts were full. Their hearts were full with Iman. And you look at how many people today, bank balances are full, but their hearts and their lives are totally empty. They are totally empty. And you look at these people that they had no possessions, but we remember them. And when we recall their names, we say, Radiallahu anhum, that Allah is pleased with these people. Allah is pleased with these people because they made a sacrifice for this deed. And what would happen is that when the Muhajireen began to migrate to Medina, every time one of the Muhajireen would give birth, the child would pass away. And the Jews began to say that we have cursed the Muhajireen. They will not have any children in Medina. And Asma radiallahu anha mentioned that when I migrated to Medina, I was heavily pregnant. And when she gave birth in Medina, her child lived. Her child lived. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhu was so happy that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he carried this child through the streets of Medina and he was saying takbir and the other Sahaba was saying Allah Akbar. He was saying takbir and the Sahaba was saying Allah Akbar. And upon nobody's birth were the Sahaba as happy as upon the birth of Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu. And then they took Abdullah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took him in his hands, his blessed hands. Let me tell you how blessed the hands of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were. They were so blessed that he pointed towards the moon and it split into two. His hands were so blessed that upon occasion the Sahaba radiallahu anhum had no water to do wudu with. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stuck his finger into the vessel and water began to sprout from his finger. And 1400 Sahaba did wudu from that one vessel. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took a date and he chewed the date and then he placed it in the mouth of Abdullah. And the first thing which went into his stomach was the blessed saliva of the Prophet ﷺ. And let me tell you how blessed the saliva of the Prophet ﷺ was. That upon occasion, Uthman anhu, he had a well. And this well, the water was bitter. And the Prophet ﷺ placed his saliva into this well. And the water became sweet and it remained sweet. This was the same saliva that when Abu Bakr anhu was bit by a snake, the Prophet ﷺ took his saliva and he placed it upon his foot. And it was as though Abu Bakr had never been bitten by a snake. And then the Prophet ﷺ named him Abdullah. And in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, Khairul Asma, Abdullah wa Abdul Rahman. And then the Prophet ﷺ supplicated for him. And let me tell you how blessed the supplication of the Prophet ﷺ was. Upon occasion, the Prophet ﷺ made a dua for Jabir radiallahu anhu's camel. And Jabir radiallahu anhu mentioned that before the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, my camel could barely walk. It could barely walk. And after the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, there was no camel which could catch up my camel. There was no camel which could race with my camel. This was the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. And then from the blessed lap of the Prophet ﷺ, he went into a home which instilled in him piety and bravery. And this is why Asma radiallahu anha mentioned, when all other children would ask to play with toys, Abdullah would ask for a sword.
He would ask to play with the sword. And this doesn't mean that these were bloodthirsty people. No, the only time they lifted their swords was to alleviate oppression and to restore injustice, to restore justice. This was the only time. If you look into their lives, these were humble people. They never professed to be Rambos or Terminators, nor did their weapons have upon them born to kill. On the contrary, if you look, on the sword of the Prophet ﷺ, Ali radiallahu anhu mentioned that I saw a note upon the sword of the Prophet ﷺ and what this note had, it had these words, it said, Sul man qata'ak. It said, great ties with those who break ties with. وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ وَلَوْ عَلَى أَنفُسِكْ And speak the truth even if it goes against yourself. وَأَحْسِنْ إِلَى مَنْ أَسَاءَ عَلَيْكْ And be good to those who are bad to you. This was the teaching that these people were brought up on. They were brought up on truth. Then the weapons didn't have born to kill. They didn't profess to be Rambos or Terminators. The only time they lifted their swords was for the sake of the truth. And this is why the Sahaba radiallahu anhu mentioned that there were three things regarding Abdullah ibn Zubair that nobody contested. One was his worship, the second was his eloquence, and the third was his bravery. And such was his bravery that even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa bore witness to the bravery of Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu. On occasion, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they amassed all their children for them to be blessed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And the children were all shy to go advance with the Prophet and the first child who advanced to the Prophet ﷺ was Abdullah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Huwa ibn, Huwa ibn He is the son of his father. Like his father is a man, he's a man. Like his father is brave, he is brave. And really, you contrast that to our children today. You contrast that to our children today. They're scared of everything. They're scared of their own shadows. Because this is what the parents instill in them. When they can't look after their children, what do they do? They scare them of the doorbell. They scare them of the cat. They scare them of the dog. They scare them of the policeman. And the ultimate terror, the terror which makes Freddy Krueger look like a nun, the Molvi. Scare them of the Molvi. Upon occasion I was walking down Birmingham and there's a woman who couldn't look after a child. And she said, behave yourself otherwise I'll tell Molvi sir. And the child froze. Because this is what you instill in your children. And the reality is, when you instill this in your children, indirectly, you are instilling in them the fear of those people who represent the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reality is that that person gave, brave, gave testimony to the bravery of Abdullah ibn Zubayr, that man from who the shaitan would run away from. Upon occasion, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu was walking. And he was... Can I get some water there, please? <clears throat> <clears throat> Upon occasion, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu was walking through the streets of Medina. And he saw a group of children playing. And who was Umar? Umar radiallahu anhu was that person regarding who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, If Umar walks down one path, shaitan scarpers from that path. He runs away from that path. And Umar radiallahu anhu was walking and he saw a group of children praying, playing. And when they saw Umar radiallahu anhu, they all ran besides one. And Umar radiallahu anhu came to this child and he said, all your friends have run away, why did you run away? And he said, because I have done no, nothing wrong that I should run away. And nor is the path so narrow that you can't get past. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he turned to this child and he said, who are you? And he said, I'm Abdullah, the son of Zubair radiallahu anhu. Really, this was a man who they bought test the Prophet sallallahu and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu bought testimony to his bravery. But it wasn't just bravery, he had immense strength. And the reason the ulama mentioned for his strength was something that me and you will regard as gross. Because we did not sit at the feet of the Prophet ﷺ. We did not have the love for the Prophet ﷺ like these people had for the Prophet ﷺ. Upon occasion, the Prophet ﷺ said to Abdullah, he had some cupping done, some blood extracted. And he said, Abdullah, dispose of this in a place where nobody will find it. And he, when Abdullah came back, the Prophet ﷺ said, did you dispose it of of it in a place where nobody will find it. And he said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, what did you do with it? And he said, I drank it. I drank it. See, something me and you may regard as gross, but me and you cannot imagine that the love that these people had for the Prophet Sallallahu
Really, me and you can never imagine this. And he said, oh Messenger of Allah, I drank it. So my Iman and my knowledge increases. And so that I have a portion of your body in my body. And my body is more befitting than the earth that it takes your blood. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, O oh Abdullah, glad tidings unto you, for the fire of Jahannam cannot touch that body which has my blood running through it. And the impact that this blood had upon his physique, it had immense impact upon his physique. He didn't use horse growth, horse growth hormones. So his biceps get bigger. No. The impact that this had upon his body. Abu Malaika was asked upon occasion from uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahmatullah alayhi, upon occasion asked Abu Malaika, he said, describe Abdullah ibn Zubair to me. And he said, I swear by Allah, I have never seen a man whose skin sat upon his flesh like the skin of Abdullah ibn Zubair sat upon his flesh. And I have never seen a man whose flesh sat upon his muscles like Abdullah ibn Zubair's flesh sat upon his muscles. And I have never seen a man whose muscles sat upon his bones like the, like the muscles of Abdullah ibn Zubair sat upon his bones. This was the barakah of the blood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you know how old Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu was when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. He was only 10 years old. And that means that he, he had drunk the blood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before the age of 10. You can imagine from this how much love that these people had for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu, both of them would consult him. And then in the time of Usman radiallahu anhu, it would be no exaggeration to say that the man who was the mastermind behind the conquest of North Africa was no other than Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu. Vast portions of North Africa were con conquered because of Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu. In the time of Usman, he sent an army under Abdullah ibn Sa'd. And then he sent with this army some eminent Sahaba, the likes of Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, Hussein radiallahu anhu, and Abdullah ibn Zubair. And Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu, he would watch the way the battle raging every day. And he suggested something to Abdullah ibn Saab. He said, why don't you do this? Why don't you divide the armies into two? And what would happen is that every day from morning to the, the Dhuhr Azan, the, they would fight. And when the Dhuhr Azan would be given, both armies would retreat to their camps. So next day, they divided the armies into two. One uh, portion of the army remained in the tent and the other fought. When the Zawr Azan was given, today the Muslims didn't retreat, they carried on fighting. And they fought until they were totally fatigued. Until they had no energy left. And then, when they were totally fatigued, both armies, the Muslims retreated to their camps. And the enemy was resting. And the fresh Muslims, they left their camps and they attacked the enemy. And before they knew what had happened, the Muslims had set upon them. And amidst this frenzy, Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu saw the leader of the enemy, a man called Jarjeer, and he was sitting upon his throne and he was being fanned by two women. And Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu, he took bayah from 30 men, bayah to the death. And with these 13 men, he ripped through the enemy lines and he reached the other side. And Jurjir was enjoying, he was chilling out with his women. You know, the good life, but only in this life and nothing in the afterlife. And he thought it was a messenger until Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu came close. And then he saw the intent in the eyes of Abdullah ibn Zubair. But by that time, it was game over. And then the takbir started. And Abdullah ibn Saad insisted that Abdullah ibn Zubair go and inform the Khalifa Usman radiallahu anhu about what had happened. And when Abdullah ibn Zubair reached Medina, Usman radiallahu anhu said, Oh Abdullah, give us an account of what happened. And when Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu stood up and he began to give an account, Usman radiallahu anhu heard his eloquence and he said, Ka'annahu Abu Bakr. He said, in his eloquence, he's like his grandfather Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And then in, six, in 56 Hijrah, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu decided to make his son Yazid the Khalif. Many of the eminent Sahaba disagreed with this. The likes of Hussein radiallahu anhu, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, and Abdullah ibn Zubair. And Muawiyah radiallahu anhu would say that none of the others have the ability to take the Khilafah from Yazid besides Abdullah ibn Zubair. No Hussein, no Abdullah ibn Umar, no Abdullah ibn Abbas. 
And then in 64 Hijrah, Hussein ibn Numayr, he, after taking Medina, he besieged Mecca. And whilst he was besieging Mecca, the news came that Yazid had passed away. And then the same Hussein ibn Numayr wanted to give bayah to Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu. But Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu refused to take his bayah because of the atrocities that he had committed in Medina. And then Hussein ibn Numayr went to back to Damascus. Then the son of Yazid, Muawiyah the second, wanted to give bayah to him. But before he could give bayah to him, he passed away. Then Marwan ibn al-Hakam, who was the next Khalifa, wanted to give bayah to Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu. But when he left Damascus, Abaydullah ibn Ziyad managed to convince him to not give bayah. Because Abaydullah ibn Ziyad was the man who instigated the Shahada of Hussein radiallahu anhu. And he knew that if Abdullah ibn Zubayr became the Khalifa, his days were numbered. And he managed to convince Marwan ibn al-Hakam not to give bayah to Abdullah ibn Zubair. And then after Marwan ibn al-Hakam passed away, then Abdul Malik ibn Marwan became the Khalifa. And at that time there were two Khalifas. One was the legitimate Khalifa and the other was the false Khalifa. The legitimate Khalifa was Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu. From 63 Hijrah, 64 Hijrah, he was the legitimate Khalifa. And the majority of Hijaz, Palestine and Iraq gave way to Abdullah ibn Zubair. And a handful of people in Damascus and the surrounding area, Sham, gave way to Marwan, Abdul, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And what would happen is that periodically there would be clashes between both of these armies until finally the army of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan took over Basra and they killed this brother of Abdullah ibn Zubair, Mus'ab. And then on that occasion, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan made an announcement. He said, who is ready to take Abdullah ibn Zubayr on? And the tyrant of this Ummah stood up, a man called Al-Hujjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. And regarding Al-Hujjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahmatullah alayhi said, if all the previous Ummahs bought their tyrants, and we only brought Al-Hujjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, his tyranny would be greater than all their tyrannies put together. He was a man who would get a kick out of seeing people's blood flow. And he said, Oh Mirul Mu'mini, I will take him on. Because yesterday I saw a dream that I am killing Abdullah ibn Zubair and then I am skinning him. And then with a huge army, he set towards Makkah. And with this huge army, they besieged Makkah. And what they had were these huge catapults. And they were in these catapults, they would have these huge rocks. And they would throw them into Makkah. And scores of innocent people died. At occasions that these rocks would even hit the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many times they would hit the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the narrations mentioned that Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu, he was praying salah. And one of these rocks fell close to him. And the fire between, went between his chest and his beard. But he was so immersed and engrossed in his salah that he didn't even know what had happened. And this is why they say that there were three things that nobody disputed regarding Abdullah ibn Zubayr. One was his bravery, the second was his eloquence, and the third was his worship. Because when he would stand in salah, the narrations mentioned that he would be so motionless. He would be so motionless that it was as though he was a piece of wood. And when he would go into ruku and sajda, he would remain for such a long period that birds would perch upon his back. Because he had learned salah from his grandfather Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr had learned it directly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And the narrations mentioned that these huge catapults were around Makkah. And what happened is that for occasion, as lightning came from the sky, and it hit one of these catapults. And Hujaj men were taken aback that this is the azab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But like all deviant and corrupt leaders, Hujaj used the Quran and the Hadith to substantiate, to support his abhorrent actions. And he said, what are you getting worried for? This is not the azab of Allah. Have you not read the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he would accept the sacrifices of the people of before, a fire would come from the sky. And it would burn their sacrifice. This is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting our sacrifice. And like all sheep, they said, Subhanallah, Allah Akbar, Takbir Allah Akbar. And then they began again. And for five months and 17 days, they besieged Makkah. 
for five months and seventeen days until the narrations mention that the men of Ab- Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu became so weak that many of them could no longer carry their swords. They had nothing to eat and no only thing that they had to drink was Zamzam. And Al-Hujaj ibn Yusuf was saying that whoever leaves the side of Abdullah ibn Zubair and comes to me, I will give them protection. And he was saying to Abdullah ibn Zubair, he was saying, Abdullah, for you, you can go wherever you want. Leave Makkah and go wherever you want. Or if you don't want to do that, then come to Abdul Malik ibn, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And he will do whatever he wants with you. And then your final option is that you fight to the death. And the narrations mention that one by one, one by one, all of the men of Abdullah ibn Zubair left his side. The narration mentioned that in one day, 10,000 men left his side. And he was literally by himself, he had a handful of men left with him. And then he decided to go and visit his mother Asma radiallahu anha. And very rarely, wallahi, very rarely has history captured such a discussion. The reality is that no speaker, no orator can depict the emotions and the Im- iman which was prevalent in that room that day. And he went to his mother and she was over a hundred years old and she was blind. And when he entered the room, he gave her salam and she replied to his salam. And then she asked him, where have the men of Al-Hujjaj reached? And he said, Inna fil mawti la raha. He said, Oh my mother, in death I will find peace and tranquility. And then he said, Oh my mother, all my companions have left me, hatta waladi wa ahli, until my own family and my children have left my side, and I only have a handful of people around me. Wa qawmun yu'tini ma uridu min dunya And the people are ready to give me whatever I want from this dunya, meaning that they are allowing me to go wherever I want. Famadha rayuk. What is your opinion, O oh my mother? And his mother said, Ya Bunaya, and Ta'alum bin Nafsik. She said, Oh my son, you are more knowledgeable regarding your circumstances than me. And then she said, But I do say that if you know that you are on the truth, if you know that you are on the truth, then die like your companions. Subhanallah, this is the coolness of her eyes. This is her child, and she's telling him that if you are on the truth, then die like your companions died. When she would define her child, she would say, Qawwaman, sawwaman, barran liwaladayhi. That he would pray profusely, that he would fast profusely, and he would always obey his parents. And she's telling the coolness of her eyes. She's saying that if you know that you are on the truth, then die like your companions die. Wa in kunta turidu dunya, fabi'sa abdu ant. And she said, if you want the dunya, then you are the most wretched of people. You are the most wretched of people because you have wasted yourself and you have wasted your companion. And how long are you going to live in this dunya? How long are you going to live in this dunya? And then she said, if you say that you are on the truth, but when your companion left you, you became weak. Then she said, She said, this is not the action of free men and the people of deen. وَكَمْ خُلُودُكَ فِي الدُّنْيَا And how long are you going to live in this dunya? And then he said, Oh my mother, إِنِّي أَخَافِ He said, Oh my mother, I'm scared that if they kill me, then they will mutilate my body and they will hang me up. And subhanallah, she said really words which exemplify the iman of these people. She said, يَا بُنَيَّا إِنَّ شَعْتَ الْمَزْبُوحَةَ لَا يُؤْلِمَ الصَّلْخِ She said, Oh my son, a slaughtered goat doesn't feel the pain when it is skinned. A slaughtered goat doesn't feel the pain when it's his skin. And then when she said this, he stood up and he kissed her upon his forehead. And he said, oh my mother, wallahi hadha ra'i. He said, I swear by Allah, this is my opinion. And I have no desire to live in this dunya, for my aspirations is the hereafter. And all my life I have stood up for the truth. But all I wanted to know is your opinion, so that your opinion strengthens my opinion. And then his mother said, come closer my son. And when he came closer to her, she embraced him. And when she embraced him, she felt that he had some metal armor on. And she said, oh my son, what is this? For people who want shahada, don't wear this. And he said, oh my mother, I only did this to comfort you. And she said, my son, take it off. 
And then she said, Oh my son, tie your izar, tie your belt. So when you fall, your aura is not exposed. Subhanallah, she's sending her son to an imminent death, but she's still concerned about every facet of his deed. And then she said, Oh my son, fight with bravery, for you are the son of Zubair, and you are the grandson of Abu Bakr, and your grandmother was Safiya radiallahu anhum. And the narrations mention that on that day, Abdullah ibn Zubair went out and he fought like a thousand men. And why shouldn't he fight like a thousand men? For he was the son of Zubair radiallahu anhu. And Zubair radiallahu anhu was that person. Upon the occasion, Umar radiallahu anhu, he sent a thousand men to war. And on the head of those thousand men, he sent Zubair radiallahu anhu. And he wrote a letter to that governor. He said, I am sending you a thousand men. And at the head of these thousand men is Zubair. He himself is equivalent to a thousand men. And the narrations mention that Abdullah ibn Zubair, from noon until evening he fought. And one by one all his men died until he was left by himself. And he will repel huge numbers of men until finally they threw a rock upon him. And then he was on the floor and he was still fighting. And then they cut off his leg and finally they martyred him. And the narration mentioned that when they martyred him, Makkah erupted with crying. Subhanallah, the day he was born, Medina erupted with happiness. And the day he died, Makkah erupted with crying. And Hujaj ibn Yusuf al-Sakafi stood up and he said, O people, know that Abdullah was the best of people. But when he rebelled against the Khalif, then he had to be removed from Makkah. For Adam was best of people. And when he rebelled against the commands of Allah, he was removed from Jannah. And Adam is better than Zubair. And Jannah is better than Makkah. See, twisted people. See, the very nature of twisted people is that they will always give you twisted analogies. And there was no man who was more twisted than Al-Hujaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi He was the most twisted of people. And then the narrations mention that Hujaj, he came to the mother of Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu, and he wanted to break her resolve. And he said, how has Allah dealt with his enemy? And Asma radiallahu anhu, these were people who weren't scared of death. He said, you may have corrupted this dunya, but he has corrupted your akhirah. And then, Hujaj said, I heard they call you Zat and Taqain, the one with the two waist belts. And she said, yes, they call me the one with the two waist belts. Because I took off my waist belt and I tore it in two, two. And I gave one to the Prophet wasallam, and I kept one myself. But then she said, let me tell you one thing. I heard the Prophet wasallam say that from Saqif, two people will emanate. One will be a tyrant and the other will be a liar. The liar that we, we have seen and the tyrant and the man who is bloodthirsty is you. She said these were people who were full of iman. Because they had sat at the feet of the Prophet wasallam. They weren't scared of death. They weren't scared of death. He thought that he could break her resolve. But she gave him a slap in his face. And then what they did is that they beheaded Abdullah ibn Zubair. And they stuck his body up. And the men of... Hujaj was saying, Allahu Akbar, Takbir Allahu Akbar, Takbir Allahu Akbar. And Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he went by and we heard them saying takbir. And he turned towards the body of Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu. And he said, I was there the day that Abdullah was born. And I am here the day he has died. And I heard those who said takbir on the day he was born. And I have heard those who have said takbir on the day he has died. And I swear by Allah that those who said takbir on the day he was born were far greater than those who have said takbir today were far greater than those who have said takbir today. And then the narration mentioned that there was a beautiful fragrance coming from his mutilated body. And what the men of Hujaj did is they tied a cat around his waist. A dead cat. And the narration mentioned that the fragrance was so beautiful that even over the stench of the dead cat you could smell this fragrance. You could smell this fragrance. And then they went to Al-Hujaj and they said, Al-Hujaj now take his body down, it's been up for days. And he, Hujaj said, I swear by Allah, I swear by Allah, I will not take it down until Asma comes and begs me. And when they told Asma radiallahu anha, she said, take me to where my body is, body of my son is. Because she was blind at the time. And they took her to where the body of her son was. And she made dua for her son. And then she said words which history records. He said, Ama ana lihazul faris ayyanzil. He said, Ama ana lihazul faris ayyanzil. He said, isn't it time 
that this knight of Allah was allowed to come off his horse? Isn't it time that this knight was allowed to come off his horse? And when they told the Hajjaj what she had said, he felt so little that he knew he had lost the battle. And then he brought the body of Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu down. See, this was a man who lived and died for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How much time do I have left? See, these were men who lived and died for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the unfortunate reality is that me and you, me and you, we are brave for all the wrong things. But if there's one thing that we are not brave for, and that is the haqq and the truth. Because we have made role models, those people who don't, are not deserving of being role models. How many people here, really, how many people here have ever heard the name of Abdullah ibn Zubair before this day? How many people know anything about the life of Abdullah ibn Zubair? We know the names of the children of Beckham and Victoria. We know all the names of the football teams that we like, Celtic and Rangers. But how many of us actually know about those people who should be our role models? And this is why the Muslim Ummah is in the state that we're in today. We know about everybody else, but we don't know, we don't know anything about the life of the Prophet wasallam, And we have made other people our role models. If you look into the life of the Prophet wasallam, look, if you look at kindness and good people and forbearing people, you will see many in humanity. But wallahi, you will never see a man who was more forgiving than the Prophet wasallam, more caring than the Prophet wasallam. The Prophet wasallam had a Jew, had a Jew as a neighbor. And what the Jew would do on a daily basis is that he would put thorns in the path of the Prophet wasallam every night. On the hope that when the Prophet ﷺ would go and relieve himself, these thorns would prick the Prophet ﷺ. And upon occasion, the Prophet ﷺ heard that the son of the Jew was ill. And the Prophet ﷺ hurried to the house of this Jew. And he knocked on the door. And the father, whose life ambition, it was to harm the Prophet ﷺ, opened the door. And what must have gone through his mind when he saw the Prophet ﷺ? And then the Prophet ﷺ came into the house. And he sat by the bed of this child. And he said, No, oh my son, bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And I, am in his, and I am his messenger. And I will bear witness. And I will intercede for you on the day of judgment. And this child began to look at the father. This child began to look at the father. And the father whose life ambition it was to harm the Prophet ﷺ. When he saw the character of the Prophet ﷺ, his heart melted. And he said, Oh my son, obey whatever Muhammad tells you to do. And the child recited the kalima, and shortly after this he passed away. And the narration mentioned the Prophet ﷺ left the house, and he was in an elated mood, and he was slapping his thighs, and he was saying, Oh praise be to Allah, who has made me a source of removing one person from eternal doom into eternal success. This was the role model. This was the character of the Prophet ﷺ. And really, you compare that today. Who have we made our role models? Look at those who are even practicing. You know, how often do people actually rub off on us? How often do people see our character and say, Yes, that's how I want to be. Those are even practicing. How often do you hear complaints from brothers who are practicing that their family say, look, if this is religion, if this is Islam, the way he practices it, we don't want nothing about, we don't want nothing over from this religion. For his character stinks. Because he wants to shove his ideology down the throats of other people. For 15, 20 years, he's been whining and dining. And Allah finally gives him hidayat. And then he comes home and he wants to revolution his, revolutionize his home in a day. It doesn't happen like that. That's why you have to have sabr. If you look at the way the Prophet ﷺ dealt with his family, the love and affection that he showed to his family, which brought them all closer. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was at Bibi Halima, when he was suckling, he had a sister through just breastfeeding called Shima. And the Prophet ﷺ, 50 years later, 50 years later, the Prophet ﷺ heard that Shima was coming through Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ requested that she be brought to Masjid Nabi ﷺ. And she was a kafir, a mushrika at the time. And the Prophet ﷺ, when she entered the masjid, he took off his cloak and he placed it on the floor. And Shima, she began to shake. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Shima, why are you shaking for? And she said, Oh Muhammad, I heard that you are a king now. 
And, and the Prophet ﷺ said, No, Shima, like you are the daughter of a poor lady. I too am the son of a poor lady. And then he made her sit on his blessed cloak. And he showed her his foot where she had bit him whilst they were a child. And the mark was still there. And then when Shima was about to leave, he sent her off with a camel laden with goods. With a camel laden with goods. And when Shima reached to her village, she gathered all the women of her village and she said, O oh, women of the village, O oh, women of the world, know that no sister has been given a brother like I have. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and my brother is his messenger. See, forget about family. The reality is that those people who remain in the company of the Prophet ﷺ for even a moment, they saw the virtues of the Prophet ﷺ. Upon occasion, the Prophet ﷺ was walking with a Bedouin who had never seen before and he walked by a tree and he broke a branch off of the miswak and then he broke it into two, into two and one was straight and the other one was crooked and the Prophet ﷺ gave the straight one to the Bedouin and the Bedouin said, Oh Messenger of Allah, why did you do this? And the Prophet ﷺ said, In the abdasa yus'alu an suhbati sa'atin Man will be asked regarding a moment of companionship and when I'm asked regarding this moment, I want to say I gave you preference over myself. Forget about the family, forget about the Mushriks, the reality is that even inanimate objects, when they stayed in the company of the Prophet ﷺ, they fell in love with the Prophet ﷺ. In the early part of Islam, the Prophet ﷺ would give a Juma khutbah leaning upon a tree. And a lady came to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I have a slave who's a very good carpenter and if you wish I will ask him to make a pulpit for you. And the Prophet ﷺ agreed and the narrations mentioned that next week when the Prophet ﷺ ascended the pulpit, this was narration is Tawatur. There was, it was the Jummah prayer and there were many people sitting there and each one of them, they, they explained this narration and what this tree did in, its, uh, in their own words. And the narration mentioned that when the Prophet ﷺ descended from, from the pulpit, the Prophet ﷺ ascended from the pulpit, what happened is that from that tree, they heard a crying. And some Sahaba anhu mentioned that it began to sob like a small child begins to cry. Others mentioned it began to shake like if it was about to explode. Others mentioned that it was like a sheep camel. It was crying like a sheep camel which is giving birth. Others mentioned that it was like a small child whose mother had been taken away from it. Others mentioned it was like a sheep camel whose small child had been snatched away from it. And when the Prophet ﷺ heard it crying, he descended from the pulpit and he embraced it. He embraced it until the sobbing slowly stopped. And then the Prophet ﷺ gave him an option of being a tree in Jannah from which the Anbiya and the Sulaha will eat from and it chose to be a tree in Jannah. And Hassan Basri rahmatullah alayhi mentioned that if this is the love that a tree has for the Prophet ﷺ, then what is the love that the Muslims should have for the Prophet ﷺ? And the reality is, my dear respected brothers and sisters, that we have made everything else our role model besides the Prophet ﷺ. Going back to Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu was a martyr. And on the days of, on the day of judgment, many martyrs will come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For some martyrs, the land of Iraq will give a witness. For some martyrs, the land of Kashmir will give a witness. For some martyrs, Philistine will give a witness. For some martyrs, Chechnya will give a witness. For some martyrs, Qabshia will give a witness. For some martyrs, Tabuk will give a witness. For some martyrs, Uhud will give a witness. For some martyrs, the battle, the plain of Badr will give a witness. But who will give a witness for Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu. When Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu was brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took him in his hand, he said, Ah huwa huwa, la yamna anna al-bayt, wa la yamutanna duna. He said, is this the child which will, which will protect the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and which will die protecting the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the day of judgment, no other, then the house of Allah will bear a witness to the martyrdom of Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who love the Sahaba Ridwan Allah jma'een. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who follow their precepts and the precepts of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in this dunya and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us in Jannah for those subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs>